Welcome to Crittenden Drive Church of Christ. It's good to see everyone. Everyone's looking so nice today on this Easter day. Uh, we want to say welcome to everyone, especially to our visitors. We want you to know that you are our honored guest today, and we are glad that you are here. And we're excited to worship the Lord this morning. Um, David is going to lead us to the throne room. He's going to lead us as we sing and praise the Lord. David? Let us all stand for our opening song this morning. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with song, we'll have our opening prayer.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've given us, that you've given us the, the health and the, the well-being to be here this morning and to sing these songs of praises to you and to worship you. And Father, we, we want to be mindful for those who are not able to be here this morning. And uh, we have many on our sick list. And, and Father, we just ask that you would be with each one of those uh, as they are battling uh, different illnesses and, and as uh, they're striving to get better and those that are taking care of them. And, and we just pray that you'd be with all of them and help them to have a better, a better portion of health. And Father, we are just so thankful for our congregation that meets here at Crittenden Drive and for uh, the ability we have to worship together here and to uh, let our light shine and reach out in uh, our community and other communities and, and strive to spread your word. Father, we're just thankful for Jesus that came to this earth and lived as a man and died on the cross and was resurrected and ascended back to heaven and will come back to get us again someday, the ones that have lived according to his, to his will. And we're so thankful for that opportunity that we have as Christians. Father, we ask that you would be with our world leaders, that you would um, help them to look to you for the strength and the guidance, the wisdom that they need to make the decisions that will be best. Father, we ask that you'd be with all those that are serving in our armed forces, that you would be with each one of them and as, as they are off and away from home and their families and just be with them and their families as they make these sacrifices to protect us and to to serve us and Father we pray that you would be with us in everything that we do here this morning and that everything we do would glorify your name. Father we ask that you forgive our sins and help us strive to be better Christians each day and uh, be with us as we go on through this service and uh, throughout our classes and throughout this day and uh, uh, just be with us in everything that we do and Again, thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, and Father, in his name we pray these things. Amen. Lo, in the grave he lay.
this next song we'll use to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. We gather here in Jesus' name. As we meet around this table, I don't know whether a lot of you can see this or not, but right on the front of the table it says, this do in remembrance of me. Take the bread, drink the cup, remember the Lord. In Mark, we are reminded of the suffering, the sacrifice on the cross, the burial in a borrowed grave and the resurrection on the third day to where Jesus went and sat at the right hand of God our Father. As we let our minds go back to the cross on this day, we know that there's a lot of Christians that are remembering the sacrifice that was made. And we just pray that you'll be with them and be with us. Let us pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we meet around this table this morning to take of this bread to remember the sacrifice and the the body that was given on this cross. Father, we pray that we will take it in a well-pleasing manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Again, Father, as our minds go back to the cross, for the blood that was shed on the cross, for the sacrifice that was made, we just pray, Father, that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we will do so in a well-pleasing manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the convenience of it, we will now uh, take up an offering to help the works of the church, not only here in this community, but throughout all the world. Let us pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we just come to you to say thank you for the many material things that have been bestowed upon us. We pray, Father, that as we give back a portion, that we can do it with a loving and cheerful heart, that the works here at Crittenden Drive can touch others, and we just thank you for all the blessings that you have given us, and we ask all these things in your Son, Jesus' name, amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm with the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears have still, when 
1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This song will be before our lesson this morning.
Thank you, David. Doesn't David always do a great job? He sure does. I've been there. You just can't find the start of a song before I've had that happen to me <laughs> many times. But, David, I appreciate you. I asked David, um, the, the elders asked me about a month ago to preach today, and uh, that's my favorite song from the last several years. I just love it. It's probably one of our youth group's absolute favorite songs. We sing it at camp and upstairs in the youth room. We sing it a lot. We, we love that song. And so when I got asked to speak today, I thought, man, what a, what a great song to sing today. And I asked David a month ago if he would sing that song. And we're not done with it this morning either. But uh, thank you, David. I appreciate you. So there's this phrase that you hear more often these days. I think it'll sound familiar to you. The phrase is information overload. And the idea is that we have never been more in, inundated with information. It's like, you know, it's not even close. I jotted down some uh, statistics this week that the average American is exposed to 54,000 words and 443 minutes of video through social media and the internet. Every day there are enough new tweets to fill 10 million page book. 20 million emails will be sent by the time I get done finishing this sentence. Anybody else having allergy problems? <laughs> The average person gets 220 messages or texts or updates every day. 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute. There have been more than two trillion searches for information on Google. And here's the one that really got me the most. Here's the one that really got me. Like, if, if you take all the information that was produced from the beginning of time until 2003, we produced more than that every two days now. Just mind-blowing. Every two days. We have access to information like never before, but there's the other side of that too. You see, because information has access to us as well. I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that, but it does. Um, it has access to us. My eyes are watering really bad this morning. <laughs> Can't read. And so there's this information overload. And if you don't think that's true, chances are at some point during this message, your phone is going to remind you that it's true. I just got my 10 o'clock news and conversation alert on my phone that happens at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. Anybody else? Raise your hand if you get... Does that happen to you on Sunday mornings, you get this alert? Information overload has become a diagnosable syndrome, and in, in my research, it's called IFS. And I don't want us to get that confused with IBS. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. That's not the same thing. Like, I, I think you can have them simultaneously. I don't think IFS and IBS are mutually exclusive, but IFS, it stands for Information Fatigue syndrome and one of the ways that you know that that's a thing is because when you hear it you're like I I i'm gonna google that <laughs> and it's led to some pretty common side effects i think these might sound familiar to you one is the the more external input input that we receive the less internal reflection time we have about ourselves is that fair enough? The more external input we receive, the less internal reflection we tend to do. So we've got all this external input, all this information, and it, it makes it really difficult to just stop and think about some pretty important questions. It really does. It makes it difficult. So let me ask you a question. It's kind of personal. You don't have to answer it out loud. It, actually, it's probably best if you don't. Don't do that on this one. But let me ask you a question. Do you like yourself? Do you like yourself? Like, like that's a really important question. 
But I don't know that we take much time in our lives to stop and think, do I like who I am? Do I like who I am becoming? We've just always got these external distractions. Lots of information make it very hard for us to have internal reflection. But here's the second thing that it's led to. It's led to an increasingly difficult time prioritizing what's important. Our minds have a hard time saying this information is a lot more important than this information, right? Because we just get so much information all of the time. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you get all this information all the time. You get this alerts on the, the war in Ukraine, or you get this alerts on this uh, bridge that has collapsed in Baltimore, and at the same time you're getting alerts about the, the latest Kardashian news. Uh, you, know, you just get all these alerts all the time. And you might find yourself saying, hey, what's really important? And you can become overwhelmed and stressed out because you can't prioritize. Well, this matters, but this doesn't matter that much. And it, it just becomes overwhelming. Or you become apathetic, a little depressed. And so if you ask me, that really describes what you see in our culture quite a bit these days. It really does. Like people who either feel overwhelmed and stressed out, or people who feel apathetic and a little bit depressed. I see it more and more. And I think for some of you, if you think about the workplace and the people you're around, I want you to think, is that the kind of people I see quite a bit of? And so what I want to talk about in the next few minutes, and I don't have a lot of time this morning, but what I want to talk to you about, because we have all this information that's being flooded to us all the time. All this information. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is the most important information. The most important. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the Bible, Paul writes a letter to the believers of Corinth. And these are first generation believers. Like They, they didn't grow up like us celebrating his death, burial, and resurrection and taking the Lord's Supper. They didn't grow up like that. These are first generation. And he's talked to them about a lot of things in 1 Corinthians. He's given them actually lots of information. And for the people in Corinth, information was something that they actually valued a lot. They were known for their knowledge, for their intellectualism, there were lots of important information to consider, health information, financial information, relationship information, because it has the most personal and most significant implications. But here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I have passed on to you what is most important and what has also been passed on to me. He says it's, it's, it's the most important thing. It's the most important information, guys, that you'll ever hear. And here it is. Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Just as the scripture said. That's the most important thing. That's the most important information. He told them all this information to the Corinthians. But he says this is the most important. Well, what... What makes it most important is its implications. Like this isn't just information about something that happened. It's information that makes a difference right now. The way that we gauge the importance of information, guys, a lot of times we think it's with this question. Is the information important? But that's not the right question. Let's just be real honest. The way we really gauge information is not just is the inf information important, but is the information important to me? For you, is the in information important to you? Let me give you an example, right? Like you're, you're watching the news, and you see a little red bar across the bottom of the screen that there's tornado warnings, and you're thinking, okay, oh man, man, that's some information right there. And so you look at that information, and you see that, that there's actually a tornado happening, but oh, it's in Kansas. And that doesn't look like where I live. 
And so we see that information, and it doesn't concern us that much because that's not a problem necessarily for me in my area. But let's say we get that information, we're watching the news, and all of a sudden you see your house come up on the TV, and you see winds blowing, t- trees been over at my house, right? And so, you, and then you all of a sudden, I hear the sirens blowing, and right? And David Johnson's dairy is just a half mile away, and so I see one of his cows go flying by. Then I probably realize, man, this information is important to me, right? So that's the question that we ask: is not is this important? Not is this information important, but is this information important? to me. And this is the importance of Easter. It has implications for you like right now. It doesn't matter because it happened. It matters because something is happening and needs to happen in this moment. And so Paul says, here's what makes it important in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 17. The first thing that makes it important, he said, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then your faith is useless. And we're all wasting our time here. How many people went to a lot of effort to get their Easter outfit ready? How many of us go to a lot of effort to come to church because we decide that church and my faith in Jesus Christ is important? We have people that drive here from Todd County, from Muhlenberg County. We have people that drive from all over just to come to church because their faith is important to them. But he says right here, if Christ hasn't been risen from the dead, then your faith is useless. And the interesting thing, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then then we should be pitied because we're making that the center of our lives. And then he says, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, then you are still guilty in your sins. You're still separated from God. You still owe a debt that you can never pay, right? You'll never be good enough to make it on your own. And if Jesus Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then there's still this disconnect between you and between God. You're still guilty in your sins. You're you're still a slave to sin. Your chains are not gone. But because Jesus has been risen, we can be set free from sin. So the most important thing, the most important thing about you doesn't need to be what you did. I want you all to hear me on this. The most important thing about you doesn't need to be what you did. It can be what's done for you through Jesus. I've got these, uh, I've got a lot of minister friends. <laughs> and uh, man, we laugh and reminisce. Y'all, you, know, you know how if I get something on you, I may bring it up five years from now, ten years from now, and remind you of it to laugh about it, and we laugh about it, right? So I have this renewal with all these youth ministers, and, and honestly, half of them are preachers now, but we get together in August every year. And then I have the young guys, when we get together in April, and that one's coming up with Jackson and Bryson and those guys. Um, and it's funny because we have so many inside jokes. But one of my preacher buddies, several years ago, he, he you know, everybody's going around the circle and telling about their past year and how their marriage is doing and all this stuff and 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 I'm not going to give anything that's you know private for them but but this one guy he tells us he says oh my goodness there's been drama in my house I said you know what's going on he said my wife decided that she wanted to buy a white couch And he says, we have three little girls in the house. And we bought a white couch. And now we have a sitting room with a white couch. But we're not allowed to go in there and sit. So we go to the threshold and we look into the room. But we can't go in the room. 
because we can't get the white couch dirty. And he tells us that, right? So that was that year, and, you know, we all just kind of laughed about it. Well, the following year, I don't know, somebody said, somebody asked him, they said, hey, how's that white couch doing? He said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> he said, you know, one day I came home from work, and he said, I knew, I knew something was wrong. He said, my wife was mad. She said, you come in here. He said, I went right to the threshold. I stopped and I looked in. <laughs> and he said, what is it? She said, no, come in here. And he said, I was kind of afraid to go in. You know, we don't go in here. But he said, I went in. He says, and she takes the cushion on the couch and she flips it over to reveal a stain. And it was purple, a purple stain. And he says, I realized, look at it. I'm like, he said, well, I, I didn't do that. He said, I didn't, I didn't do that. And purple's not my color. She says, I know you didn't. Do, you know, she starts fussing at him. I know it wasn't you. He said, but she said, but one of the girls has been here. She said, this is fingernail polish. Purple fingernail polish. And it was not going to come out. And he said, so then the drama continued. He said, so... You know, I decided, okay, it's time for me to step up here and be the father. So I hollered for my three girls to, to come, and they all came, and they all got to, you know, they stopped at the threshold, stopped, and started looking. He said, but when the third daughter, the middle child, got there, she stopped and realized, and then she just took off, ran upstairs, and went and hid in her room. She went and hid because she was ashamed. And isn't that true for us in Genesis chapter 13, the first time sin comes on the scene? This is exactly what Adam and Eve do, right? They hide from God. They're ashamed of the stain. You know, that Friday when Jesus died, it, it, you know, it wasn't good for his followers. That Friday when Jesus died, it was a day of shame. It was a day of guilt. It was a day where the ugliness of sin was shown and it couldn't be denied. It was a day of reckoning. And when I think about the disciples on that day, when I think about those disciples, and when I especially think of the Apostle Peter, the shame that he must have felt. Because he had promised his Lord he would never deny him. But he denied Jesus three times. He abandoned Jesus when he needed him the most. And I think that that shame and that guilt that he must have felt, it must have to felt on that Friday, there's that stain. It's, it's the stain that gets revealed. You see, with our sins, with us, he doesn't like my sermon. I'm going to do better. I'm going to try. But our first response with sin, guys, is the exact same way. Our first response for us as well is shame and just to hide. My buddy and his wife, they said, you know, over time that, you know, they were laying in bed at night and they were talking and, they, and, and, and his wife said, you know, I, you know, I thought it was strange when I wanted to do family pictures in that room and she didn't want to and she begged for us to do it outside at this other place she said was really pretty. She said, I thought it was strange that she didn't want to do that. And the mother said, and then I thought it was strange at Christmas when we were going to go open family Christmas presents and she didn't want to do Christmas presents in there. She wanted to do them somewhere else. And it was interesting how they realized she had been living with that shame and with that guilt. And so I'm convinced that for many of us, like at the root of so much of the struggle in our lives of shame, it's shame. 
You might not see it th that way or call it that, but it is. It's shame. Like shame comes out sideways. Sometimes shame comes out as anger because maybe you're angry at yourself and it has a way of becoming angry at the world. Sometimes shame comes out as anxiety. Not just anxiety that something is going to flip the cushion and, and expose your stain, but there's an anxiety that comes when you're living a life that's not really aligned with who you want to be and how you were actually created to be. Shame sometimes comes out sideways as depression because shame always isolates. It disconnects us from people. It disconnects us from God, kind of, it disconnects us from our, ourselves in some ways. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm paraphrasing this, it says, Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, then it's just Friday. Then it's just shame and guilt and punishment. And so for some of you, maybe it's felt like Friday for a long time. But today is Sunday. Today is Sunday, and, and, and so on Sundays, that means that we can have a freedom. It means that we can have forgiveness. You know, my buddy says that he went back upstairs to his middle, da middle daughter, and he, he brought her back down. And in, in, him and his wife, they talked to her about the stain on the couch, and she had these big tears coming down her cheeks, and she told them that she, she tried to get it out herself, and it only made it worse. And some of you know what, that, what that's like. You try to get it out. You try to pretend like it didn't happen, but it just seems to get worse. And so his wife says to his middle daughter, he says, you know, honey, there is no stain that, can make, that you can make that's big enough to change how we love you. And a strange thing started to happen in his house, he said. His daughter, when they would have friends to stop by, he said it was weird. He thought it was really weird at first because his daughter would actually take her friends to the room. They wouldn't go in the room. They'd stop at the threshold. But they would get to the room, and she would point out, hey, this is the couch that I got the stain on. And he thought, why is she showing people that? He said, but then he came to realize that it, 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 it changed from something that she was ashamed of to something that she realized she had, she had love no matter what she did in her life. It came to represent how much she was loved, and that very stain that you would think she would be ashamed of was a stain that actually revealed how deeply she was cared for. That how much she's unloved, how much she's loved unconditionally, and and this is what Sunday does for the sin of Friday. It takes our sin and it turns it into a trophy of God's great love for you, and it's this beautiful celebration that we can be set free from the stain of sin. That we don't have to live under that. There's there's new life, and I love this story in Mark 16. In Mark 16, he talks about just the resurrection and how that news came, starting with verse 2. Very early on Sunday morning, just as the sun was coming up, they went to the tomb. And on the way, they were asking one another, who will roll the stone away from the entrance for us? But when they looked, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away. And the women went into the tomb, and on the right side, they saw a young man in a white robe sitting there, and they were alarmed. And, and the man said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was nailed to a cross. God has raised him to life, and he isn't here. You can see the place where they put his body. Verse 7. Now go tell his disciples, especially Peter. Especially Peter, you know, Peter who's living with his shame since Friday. Peter who is living with his guilt. Especially make sure that, that he knows that Jesus has been risen from the dead. And that means that everything that Jesus had said to them has come true. And so for some of you,
It's like, hey, tell everybody about Easter. You know, when, it, when, the, when the scripture there says, hey, hey, tell Peter, especially Peter, tell Peter, especially tell Kyle, tell Kyle, especially tell, tell Peyton, especially tell Peyton, and tell, tell Darren, especially tell Darren, make sure Darren knows, and tell Dalton, you know what I mean? Especially, to, it, that's the way it is, it's for us. It's for all of us, especially you. Like this message, it's especially, this message is especially for you. So Friday, the day of guilt and shame, but then Saturday comes and the followers, I, you know, I wonder if they're just waiting around in fear. They think what has happened to Jesus might possibly actually happen to them. Because they're just waiting, wondering what was happening out there. And some of you, that's, that's been life. Maybe in more recent months and years, you, you feel like you're just waiting in fear for something to happen out there. And what's that, what's that going to mean for you? What's it going to mean for you now? And your worst fear is death. And maybe even death seems a little bit closer, more knocking at the door, and you're not sure what to do about it, but Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for those in Christ Jesus, there is no fear of death. I want you to think about this. We're free from the stain of sin, but guys, we are also free from the fear of death. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, everyone who belongs to Christ has been given New life. All who belong to Jesus will be raised back when he comes back. Because of the resurrection, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? So Friday is a day of shame and guilt. Saturday is a day of fear and hopelessness. But then Sunday comes and it changed everything. And there is new life. There's new life. And that's what we're celebrating. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, but we're celebrating what it means, the implications. There's new life, and without the stain of sin, without the fear of death. And you know, guys, there is just something special about celebrating new life. And I want to show you guys a 30-second clip real quick. Um, You know, we have these gender reveals now. It, 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 you know, is it a boy? Is it a girl? And with us, with Anna Reese, we didn't know. Was it a boy? Was it a girl? And we, and we opened that up. And so many of you in this room were here. You were there at my house to see that. So many of you. And, and it's the celebration of new life. And I, and I you know, I, I, man, I can't remember the last time I sh shined a spotlight on somebody from up here. But Caitlin Berry is standing back there. And it's okay to look because she is holding new life. I think the newest life in our church, right? She's holding new life right now. And we celebrate new life. And I wanted you guys to be reminded of what it's like to celebrate new life. And so if you're in this room and you've been worshiping with us this morning and we've been singing these songs, Glorify Thy Name, up, up from the grave he arose. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He's my living hope. We have this celebration because it's all about the new life. And for you, I want to talk about baptism this morning. They're telling the story. When someone is baptized, they go under the water, and it represents dying to your old self. The old is gone, and then they come up out of the water 
And it's this new life. It's the death, burial, and resurrection. In Romans 6, it talks about this. It says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life so that when someone is baptized, they're buried as Jesus was baptized. It represents new life because of the resurrection. So I think we're out of time this morning. Our new life is crying. <laughs> so this morning, you can have new life. You can put Christ on through the waters of baptism. And there are people here that need to do that. We, listen, nothing would be better on this day than to say that you put Christ on through the waters of baptism and had your sins forgiven. Bring up the uh, Acts 22 scripture. He says, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized and wash your sins, calling on his name. For some of you, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You need to do it. It needs to be your decision. You need to come and have your sins washed away so that we can have celebration of new life. There would be nothing greater, nothing greater than to have that new life this morning. Bring up my first Peter 1 verse 3. I've asked David to sing Living Hope one more time. That's going to be our invitation song this morning. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That resurrection is important. It gives us, it gives us hope. Man, it gives us hope. This morning, if there's anything that we can do for you, if you need to come forward and put him on through the waters of baptism, or if you need to come forward and have our elders come pray for you, won't you come now as we stand and as we sing? How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the
seated. We're so thankful that you have chosen to come and worship with us this morning. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for your lesson. A lot of good thoughts involved there. If you haven't filled out a, an attendance card, they're in the pew in front of you. Please fill one out, send it to the owls, and the young men will be picking those up during our closing song. As far as our um, announcements go, Janet Stanley is in rehab for her back at St. Thomas. And our congratulations to former members Clay and Clara Isom on the birth of their daughter Camille. She was born on March 24th, weighed 7 pounds, 3 ounces, and 18 and a half inches long. As far as activities that are going on, our ladies' Bible class is collecting items for a sunshine basket for Janet Stanley. Those baskets are located at either entrance. If you have any questions, please see Holly Black or Samantha Hamilton. Today will be our Easter egg hunt for babies through sixth grade. This will be following our classes, which will be following our service. Friday, April 5th, Hilldale Church of Christ will host its annual gateway celebration in song from 7 p.m. to midnight. Everyone is invited. And Lehman Avenue will be hosting Equipped 2024 from April 18th through the 21st. There will be classes for all ages. It's a free event please visit their website for more information. We hope that you will choose to stay for our Bible classes immediately following our closing prayer. We have classes for all ages, from babies up through however old you are. Um, our multi-purpose room class down the hall is, is starting a new study called Crazy Love. Um, and we have had some... Some people remarked that with the class growing in size and the big size of the, of the room that we're going to try using a microphone so that people are, can hear a little bit better. Um, so if you're interested in that, we invite you to come down and, and study with us this morning and through the rest of our study. Hope that you'll choose to come back at 5.30. We'll have our evening service and Brian White will be delivering the lesson. So be good to be encouraged by Brian and encourage him. With that, the announcements are over. I'll turn it back over to David, and he'll go from there. After this song, we'll have our closing prayer. <clears throat> you are beautiful beyond description. together. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come here today and study and worship you. Lord, we thank you that we uh, have this opportunity that, that we can take advantage of. And Father, we hope and pray that everything that we've done said here today has been in accordance with your will and that you have been uplifted. And Father, we thank you for Daniel and thank you for his ability to bring us a lesson and, and uh, allow us to uh, stir up our thoughts and our minds and 
Father, we thank you for Jesus and his death on the cross and the fact that he was raised from the dead and that we can have eternal life through him, through him. And Father, we thank you for that. Father, please be with us now as we go to our classes. We pray that you would help us to learn much and we pray for the each for the teachers and that they would be able to deliver the lessons in such a way that everyone would be uplifted. Father, we pray that you would please forgive us of our many sins and go with us always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.